welcome again to another talk. Um, I'd like to introduce Philip Kant, working at IOHK, and he's going to be talking about uh, the um, a part of the consensus layer um, of ADA. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, um, yes, I'm Philip Kant, work for IOHK, and I'm going to tell you something about the techniques that we use in order to um, have the set up the architecture for, for our system Cardano, which is a blockchain that hosts the currency ADA, to have that in a way where we can swap in and out individual layers and have it uh, modular and extensible. And for that we use a lot of abstractions. And in order, as a kind of intro introduction, let me tell you a bit about what the system actually does. So it's a, a blockchain with a cryptocurrency, and um, what, what does that actually mean? So let's look at some ways in which you can exchange money between different parties. So the, the oldest way to do that is to just have some physical objects, some coins or banknotes, and you exchange them physically. And um, that's a rather simple system. It has some nice properties. It's not possible to spend more than you have. So the instance that you get some coins, you actually have them, and you know that they haven't been given to somebody else as well. Um, it leaves no trail, which can be good or bad, depending on what you want. So if you want to have, an, have some knowledge over where you spent your money, you have to do some extra bookkeeping, but also nobody can, can see where you got your money or where you spent it. It's rather inconvenient to do that, especially uh, if you are working at a distance. So if you're at the same place, you can just do that directly. If you're in different cities, then um, it gets more complicated. And typically what you do then is that you just, <coughs> instead of exchanging physical objects, you just do bookkeeping, and you do that at some central place. You do that in a, in a central ledger that is, um, that is operated by some entity, by a bank, and if you want to send money, then you just inform the bank of your intent of doing that, and then the bank has to write that transaction into a ledger, and then the money is transferred to that other person. Uh, there you have the possibility of overspending, and it's the responsibility of the bank to make sure that all the transactions that it writes into the ledger, ledger are actually correct and valid given the history of the ledger. And um, this requires some ordering along, amongst the transactions, because if you spend some money, then you have to have received it before that. Um, one of the downsides of this is that you, um, it requires to have trust in some central authority, and if people stop trusting that authority, then bad things happen. And also the central authority, the bank, can refuse customers for whatever reason. They might refuse customers for good reasons if they are criminals, but they can also refuse them if they just don't have enough money or they don't have a home address or something like that. And so the idea of cryptocurrencies is to replace this trust in one central authority in, um, in a net with, with a network of nodes that all keep a copy of the ledger. And then um, this network is operated by many people, and you no longer have to trust any one person to do things correctly, but they control each other that they do the right thing. And then um, you basically have to trust that the protocol that they execute is correct, and that the, the, the hardware, the people operating the hardware of this centralized, of this decentralized network, all in all, is, uh, is capable enough, and uh, that the majority of those people are, are honest, and that this, that this works. Of course, if you want to have multiple copies of the ledger in a decentralized setting, then you need to have some way of ensuring that they all have the same ledger, that they don't disagree about that, because then you wouldn't know who owns what money. And how can you do that? Um, so let's take this, this ledger here that takes all the transactions. Those are some transactions that people sent. And these are the people operating the ledger um, in concert. And one way to ensure that there is consensus is that you um, um, give control to one of them for a certain time, and then you hand over control to the next one, and so forth. And then in that way, um, they share operating that ledger. So you give control over the third one, they make a transaction and enter it, and they give it to the next one, and so forth. And then sometimes it can happen that a transaction that they <coughs> want to enter is no, it's not valid given the history of the ledger. So for instance, that transaction that just vanished tried to spend the same money that that transaction were already spent, so then that transaction will be dropped, and then you continue like that. And again, this is this is fine if they are all in the same room, but um, it gets more complicated if you want to do that in a distributed setting, 
And also, if you want to do that without um, having anybody decide that it's these three people and not any number of people. And in a, in a truly decentralized thing, you would want to have anybody be able to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to take, take part in, um, in, in uh, organizing that ledger. So let's uh, look at the, how we solve that first problem. Um, so passing that ledger around physically is, is not practical. So what you do instead is that every node keeps a complete copy of the ledger, and then when it's your turn to produce to, to write some new transactions into the ledger, you just produce a new page and write the transactions in there, and you send that page around to everybody else. And in order for the other nodes to know where to place that page, you also put a reference in the, the header of that page, and you sign it to say that you have written down those transactions, and then the result is called a blockchain. So these pages of the ledger are called a block, and the, yeah, the, those, those collection of blocks is, is a blockchain. It's basically a, it's, it's a linked list that's distributed and replicated across the network. Um, of course, because propagating those blocks through the network takes time, it's possible that when it's your turn, you haven't seen the last block yet. And what happens then is that you add your block, not to the last block, but to the block before that, and then you get what's called a fork. And um, those forks need to be resolved, and that happens over time, because the next person who's, whose turn it is, the next leader of the next slot, will um, just add their block to one of those two forks, and then one of them will get longer, and then everybody will agree that this is the correct one, and that block just gets dropped. And then those transactions in there, they might get added to another block, or they might not. And so um, you get some, some eventual consistency, where the transactions that have just been added to the ledger are not, um, are not yet fixed, they might, might get dropped again, but if you look deep down into the ledger, then everything is done. So that, um, that handles the distributed part of, of the ledger. The other thing is then the uh, permissionlessness. So um, in the example that I showed you, you have these three people, but um, you have to decide on who those three people are, and um, how do you do that? How do you decide who can take turns? And for that, there are different protocols. There are a multitude of protocols, and some important class of protocols are called <coughs> proof of work or proof of stake. And let's um, have a look at what that means. So we have this, this ledger, and we have these three people. And we want other people to be able to join and take turns in controlling that ledger as well. But um, if we just say anybody can do that, then what can happen is that this person above here gets evil and pretends to be multiple persons. And then um, if they just do things in a round robin fashion, then um, that person will have control over the ledger for a long period of time. And then they can do bad things. They could send all their money in one transaction and then decide to add all their blocks for the next turns to, to, a, to, a, con to, a, to a competing fork, and then their transaction would get dropped and they would have their money again. So this is, this is bad. You want to prevent this, this kind of attack. And one way to do that, the way that uh, Bitcoin does it, is um, by something called proof of work, where it's uh, no longer the case that you take regular turns, but instead you have some kind of race where everybody uses their computer continuously to um, try to find a solution to some arbitrary puzzle. And whoever solves that puzzle first has the right to create the next block of transactions. And then, um, if you just register multiple times with the, to the system and pretend to be multiple piece, people, that, that doesn't really gain you anything because you still only have your one computer. And then as long as everybody has the same level of computing power, they can solve the puzzles equally fast. And then it's basically a coin toss who gets the next block. And then, on average, everybody will produce some fraction of blocks. Um, of course, now when I when I gave the, when I gave a practice of this talk uh, to my daughter yesterday, she said, "Yeah, but what if they ran some instances on Amazon?" And I think that's exactly <laughs> what what you can do. You can just get a bigger computer or more computers, and then you could either attack the system, but you don't really have to uh, want to attack the system um, in order to want to do this. Because um, another thing is that you are incentivized to try to produce many blocks because you get rewards for those in exchange for this computing power. And this has gotten a bit out of hand with Bitcoin, so that now everybody <laughs> who takes part in this seriously has some uh, yeah, data centers or something like that. And, and this leads to a very large energy consumption and to this, to this arms race in terms of computing power and energy consumption. And so the Bitcoin network has the energy consumption on the scale of the total energy consumption of a small country, which is a bit um, absurd. 
So uh, we we don't we don't want to to do this. Instead, we want to um, do something that is called proof of stake. And what you do there is that you replace this um, implicit lottery, where you basically say everybody the, the one who gets to solve that puzzle first wins the lottery and gets to produce the next block. You replace that by <coughs> an explicit lottery, and um, you determine the number of tickets that everybody gets by the amount of currency that they hold in that system. And this then basically this replaces the need for this for this for investing in computing power, and it also has um, nice incentives because if you own a lot of that currency, then you don't really want to attack the system because um, if the system gets attacked, the currency gets devalued, and you would lose everything that you've invested. So um, this is nice. Of course, the downside is that it's a bit more complicated. Um, I mean, you, you can look at it like this. You, you have this, this overall system that uh, keeps the ledger secure, but the system requires the ledger to be operated securely. And so it's, it's a bit of a, it's, it's, it's not really trivial to, to get this done in a, in a secure way. There are lots of attacks that are specific to proof of stake. And it's, um, it's not, not, not easy to come up with protocols that, that are secure against these attacks. But um, there is a provable, provably secure proof of stake protocol, which is called Roboros. And that's what we're using in Cardano. And um, so that was, that was pretty much the introduction. And the rest will get a bit, um, a bit more technical. So now let's uh, look at one of those nodes in the network and what it has to do. Um, and we can look at this in, in terms of, yeah, of different components or layers of the node. So you have one uh, capability that um, deals with networking and communication with other nodes. So that will have to define what a block actually looks like when it's sent over the wire. It has to talk to other nodes and ask them about their current views of the, of the ledger, of the, of the chain. And it has to ask them for blocks that it doesn't know yet about. And it has to send their newest block to those other nodes they don't have it already. So that's basically purely communication. Then um, when, you, when you have that communication, you can, you can talk about, or yeah, in general, you, you can talk about the, the protocol that those nodes should follow in order to determine what a correct and what a preferable chain is. So this, this consensus layer will have to um, do things like, given that it has some chain and given a new block, it has to decide whether it can add that block to the chain and whether that's a valid continuation of the chain. And then also when it has multiple um, continuations of the chain, it has to decide which one to pick. So when there's a fork, it has to have some, some rules depending on the, on the specified protocol, um, what, what kind of, which <coughs> chain to pick. Another thing that it has to do is to um, create new blocks and send it, send it to, the, to the network. Now to be precise, when I, when I talk about it gets some blocks or it creates some new blocks, it only cares about some, a, a very small part of the block, which is the header, which contains the, the link to the other blocks and the signatures and maybe some entropy for this explicit lottery. It doesn't really care about what the transactions are. It, it only cares that those are valid. And so the validation of the transactions that is handed off to something called the ledger. That's conceptually, it's, it's a different part. It just looks at that's a pure bookkeeping, basically. It looks at the transactions, decides whether they are valid, but it doesn't care about uh, yeah, what block, blocks or anything like that. It just has a, a consecutive list of transactions and decides whether that's <coughs> valid. And um, so then you have the, the, um, the consensus layer talking to the ledger and basically giving it those transactions and letting it decide whether that's a valid continuation of the ledger. And then the consensus layer has to decide whether, given that all those transactions are valid in the current ledger, whether this block overall is, um, is a valid continuation. And for that, it actually might need some information from the ledger, because um, if we have a proof of stake system, then the question of who has the right to sign the new block is dependent on the stake distribution, and that's something that we only get by looking at the ledger. So we need to have some interface between those two. And, um, also, the consensus layer will need some cryptographic primitives for, in order to do signatures and, and stuff like that. And then the whole thing is wrapped up in a node where you add something that's called mempool, where all the transactions live that are not yet in the ledger. So when you, have, when you get to create a new block, then you look at all the transactions that you know about that are not yet in the ledger and try to include them in the ledger and then uh, yeah, add, wrap the head around it and send it to the network. Now, <coughs> When we, want to, um, when we want to implement this, 
we want to keep those those different pieces of functionality well separated because it might be that we want to switch one for the other. For instance, if we look at the consensus layer, then uh, the researchers, they're continuously working on improving the protocol and making it more secure against certain attacks or making it more efficient or adding some more privacy in there. So you want to be able to switch it out. And um, so what we, what we want to do in order to do that is to start off with an abstract representation of a consensus layer and then later on um, write a, a concrete uh, implementation of that abstract layer given so that that implements some concrete protocol. Similarly for the ledger, so when we, when we work on the consensus layer, we only want to have an abstract view of the, of the ledger layer. And that has multiple benefits. One is that it keeps your code clean because you don't even have the possibility of using some, some implementation details from the ledger that are there by accident and using that somewhere in the consensus layer because if you only have an abstract view, then you can't do that because you don't even know what those details are. Another benefit is that um, if you do that, you can work on the concrete implementations in parallel. Um, and you can start with basically with a very simple ledger that doesn't even have to do correct bookkeeping. It just has to um, give some, some standard answers to the questions that the consensus layer wants. And then you can start off implementing your consensus layer with some, with some mocked ledger. And then later on, when the people working on the ledger layer um, have finished their work, you can combine those two because you have the interfaces fixed once you have those abstract um, representations written. And um, just to, to give an, an, an example of what you could do if you have too much detail of something that where you really don't want to have detail is this um, XKCD comic where you implement a random number function by just returning four after you roll dice. And the reason you can do that is because you know that this function returns an integer and four is an integer, but if you just do it the Haskell way, where you write a random I.O. function that just gives you an A, then uh, four is not of type A, so you can't write that down. So um, abstraction helps not messing up in, in, certain, in, in, in various ways. I think the code clean and, and more likely to be correct. Also for the crypto layer, we want to have um, different representations, <coughs> and, and what we want to start with an abstract representation. Again, because uh, some of those primitives might not yet be implemented. But another aspect is that um, if we do that, we can make our code um, better testable. So, so we can improve the testability of our, our code. You can make it easier to write tests and to interpret tests. And um, so let's look at how we do this. And um, the example that we look at are um, digital signatures. So what do you do there? You have a key pair, you have a secret key that you can use to sign some, some arbitrary data. And then you have the, the public key, the verification key, that anybody can then take the signature, the verification key, and the original data, and verify that the signature has indeed been done with a secret key for that data. And there are multiple algorithms for that. And for all of those algorithms, the, the representation of the keys and the signatures, they, they have different types. So. Um, we, we need to um, be flexible there, and luckily we, we can, thanks to the work that came out of the data parallel Haskell things, we can associate um, data types with the type classes. And so what, what we do here is that we write an, a type class, a Haskell type class, for general signature algorithms. And then for the, for the data types, for the keys and the signatures, we use associated data types. And um, they, are, they are flexible, so um, for any instance of that of that class, we can give a concrete type when we do the implementation, and we can use these these abstract types here in the signatures for the functions of, of the of the class. And then technically, this this uh, verification key digital signature it's a it's a function on the type level that, given some instance of the of this class, gives you a concrete type. And then with that, we can write um, a function for deriving a new. Um, a new signing key, and we can write a function that takes a signing key and gives us, derives a corresponding verification key, and then we can perform signatures. We need some data that needs to be serializable so that we can have a binary representation of it. The signing key, and then we get a signature um, for that algorithm of that data, and we can verify it if you have the verification key, the original data, and um, the verification. Uh, and uh, the, the signature 
and then we get a rule that tells us whether this whether is correct or not. Uh, now you might be slightly unhappy when you see those two functions and you like uh, static typing because if you look at the type of the signature, then um, it doesn't really know anything about the type of the data that you assigned. And that's bad because now you could sign something of type A and check whether the signature is correct using something of type B, which is just obviously incorrect because they don't even agree on the types so they can't be the same data. And um, so it would be good if the signature carried the type information um, of the data that it signed. And um, we, can, we can do that. We can do that by wrapping the signature up in a, in a new type wrapper, which has a, a so-called phantom type, which only appears on the type level, but doesn't influence the values. And um, by doing that, we can write wrappers around the signing and verification functions, where we say, OK, we again take some data, we take a signing key, but then we get this, this new type here, the signature, which carries the type information of the data that we signed. Sorry. And then we have a verification function where we again take the verification key, the data, and this new type around the signature that has the type information and gives us the pool. And if we only use those two functions, then uh, we can't mix up those, um, those types of the data. And um, yeah, this is, this is something that we only uh, write once for the type class, and then once we have any uh, instance for that for the class, we get it for, for all of the instances. And similarly, if we do anything with those, with, a, with an abstract um, signature algorithm anywhere in our program, then we can later on have just declare an instance for any concrete uh, algorithm and use it for that. So one, how do the, these instances look like? Um, well, basically, you just uh, import the cryptographic functionality from a library, and you wrap the types for the keys and the signature in some new types, and then you do some some uh, pattern matching to extract them, and you wrap them up in the wrappers, and, and that's it. Um, but now you have the freedom to, to change those algorithms if you, if you program against the type class. Now, why, why is this a good thing? For once, you could detect a vulnerability in some algorithm, and then you want to change it. But it's also very good for testing, and, and why is that? Um, so imagine you write some tests for your program, and the program uses some digital signatures, and then at some point, some of the tests fail. And then you look at the logs, and you look at the logs, and you see those digital, digital signatures, which are just binary data, basically. They don't tell you anything. And if you want to see whether some signatures are correct, then you have to perform the cryptography, which is very convenient. And um, so what you would like to have in, for, for, for interpreting the test logs would be like a classical signature that just says, I signed that entity X signed this, which is obviously not something that is cryptographically safe, but it is good for analyzing logs. And um, we, we can do that by writing a, a mock instance for the cryptography. We can just say, OK, our keys are just integers. And the signature is a representation of the data by using a short hash and the key that signed it. And then it just literally says, this data is signed by that key. And then we can uh, verify the signature just by comparing the numbers. And if you look at the logs, we just have the numbers there. and We see which entity signed it. And, um, not only is this easier to interpret, it's also much faster. So if you want to run tests, you want to run a lot of them. And cryptography can be computationally expensive. It should be. And um, so it, um, yeah. And so this is faster. It allows you to run more tests. And once the tests fail, you have an easier time analyzing the logs. Right. So um, let's look at something that is a bit more involved, namely, um, a, an abstract representation of consensus protocol. Again, we write a type class, or a boros tag. So this is then basically a type level tag for a variant of the Ouroboros protocol. And again, we, th this time we need some, some more associated data types. We need um, Some of those are quite straightforward. So the node will need some configuration, and that configuration will be different for different types of algorithms. You might need some, some local state of the node. This payload here, that's um, basically the protocol dependent part that's put into the header, so signature and, and hash of the last block and stuff like that. Maybe some entropy. The chain, we might have to keep track of some state of the chain that might be relevant for, for the question of whether the next block is, is valid, is a valid distinction or not. And then we need, we might need to have a view on the ledger. So this is basically, if, we have, if you have this proof of stake protocol, you need to know the stake distribution. So for proof of stake, um, protocol, this ledger view would be a function 
acting on the ledger that gives you the current state distribution. And then in that way, you, you can basically combine it with the, with, with the ledger and get the information out there. Of course, the validation of blocks can fail in multiple ways, depending on the protocol. So that's, again, a custom, custom error type per protocol. And then we'll also need some constraint on the type of blocks that we can use. So we don't want to talk about concrete block representations in the, in the protocol because that would be overly concrete and, and we, don't, we don't want to use any, any concrete details on the block the representation because that should be the, the job of the networking layer. They, they should be free to make some optimizations without breaking anything here. And also once we start, depending on some, some, um, some concrete aspects of the representation, we, we might just um, shoot ourselves in the foot by, by using some details that are exit there by accident. Um, so we, we just have a constraint that tells us, okay, when is a block when can block be used by that protocol? And that's typically um, just the sorry. Uh, that's typically then just uh, the the constraints that we have to extract this protocol specific payload from the block. We have a number of classes uh, of, of uh, methods in this class. One to construct that that protocol specific payload in the block. So that requires the the proof. Ah, I haven't uh, explained what is leader is. So is leader is basically a a representation of the proof that is indeed our turn to produce a block right now. And that's something that we want to write into the header. And then it gets the header, and then it can sign it, and um, stuff like that. And uh, the next thing is prefer candidate. So that's a function that takes our current chain, and it takes another chain that some other node tells it about, and the current slot. And then it depends, and then it tells us whether it should um, switch to that other chain. And we have a default implementation that just compares the lengths of the chains, basically, and then and then cares about um, not accepting uh, chains from the future because um, yeah, that, that would be that would be um, dangerous if we allowed people to just produce longer chains by extending them into the future when it's not the future yet. Um, <laughs> similarly, uh, we have um, an ordering on the chains, and by default, that's just ordering them by length. And we have this function that determines whether we are the leader for the current slot. So it um, gets the configuration, the slot, the current view of the ledger might be relevant, and then the, the state of the chain as well. And then if we are a leader, it gets us this proof that we are the leader that we can put into the block header, or else it just gives us nothing, and then we have to wait for somebody else to put the block. Apply chain state is the function that, given our current chain and some, some block, with an abstract representation, with abstract representation um, that basically then um, decides whether that block can be added to the current block and is, an, is, a, is a valid extension of it. And if it is, it returns us the new state of the chain. If it's not, it gives us the reason why it's not a valid extension. We also have something that's called a security parameter. That's basically a, a, um, a number that tells us uh, how long the fork can get before we basically switch to it forever. And that's something where the researchers give us some guarantees that we can't have forks that are longer than some certain number. And um, having that explicitly in, in the protocol makes it easier to do some optimizations, in particular with how we, how we store things. Because we, when we are at a, at a place where we can still switch forks, then we have to keep that fresher in, the, in memory than, than older stuff. And then Given this type class, we can program against it. And a very simple um, example is the function select chain, which takes a list of upstream chains and our current chains, and then basically tells us which chain we, so we should switch to by filtering out those that are that cannot be added, and uh, that, that by filtering out, out those that are not preferable to the ones that we have, and then sorting all those that remain, and then um, basically taking the head if that if that exists. And similarly, we can do all the other, all the other more complicated, um, all the more complicated functions um, that that we need for the protocol. We can all program against the type class, and then they will work for any for any representation for any concrete um, protocol. Speaking of concrete protocols, um, how does this look like? So um, we'll go through a very simple example, which is not yet a, a full proof state protocol. It's basically this, this uh, round robin thing that we had in the beginning. So we have a fixed set of nodes, and they just take turns producing blocks. And for that, you need um, some configuration. You need the security parameter and the number of nodes. This is fixed now. And then uh, every node needs to know its number, 
its signing key and a map that gives it the verification keys of all the nodes in the system. Uh, the payload is very simple, it's just the signature of our secret key and then most of the types are pretty trivial. So the validation error, that's just the signature is invalid, where invalid means it's, it's not the one of the, of the, it's not signed by the correct person. Um, yeah, the, the supported block constraint is just the, the requirement that we can extract this, this kind of payload here from the block. And then we not, don't need any state, we don't need the view on the ledger because we're not a proof of stake. Um, we don't need to prove that we are the leader because that's just determined by the round robin thing. And the chain also doesn't have to contain any protocol specific state. And um, yeah, if we construct, uh, let's go to the, to the implementations of the, of the methods. The make payload is basically just signing, signing the block header and adding it uh, and wrapping it in the, in the new type wrapper. Applying a block to the chain is, is, or deciding whether it can be applied is, is quite simple. We, we extract the signature from the block header and then we, um, we check the signature against the uh, verification key of the expected leader, where the expected leader is just um, determined by the, by the round robin. And if it is, then we return the new state of the chain, which is just unit, and if not, then uh, we throw an error. Similarly, checking that we are indeed the leader for the current slot is straightforward. We check whether we are one of the of the privileged nodes that take to, that take part in this round robin uh, schedule, and if we are, then we just take um, the slot number module or the number of total nodes and compare it to our number, and then we know whether we're the leader or not. Um, note that we have this this type parameter here, so we have a PFTC, and the C stands for the cryptos. We have here. Um, the, the signatures all depend on this on this parameter C, and we can just declare different. Uh, we can use different types of crypto in there. So we can use the the elliptic curve cryptography for real production use, and we can use the mock signatures for fast and real both. <coughs> so this was a very simple protocol. It's not yet a proof of stake thing, but we can also do this for for real um, proof of stake protocols. So the thing where we're, what we're doing as well is uh, called Uroboros Krauss, which is um, a permissionless proof of stake protocol. It has a private leader election where everybody for themselves makes a toy cost, so it's not, not predetermined who is the leader, so you can't attack somebody on purpose when you know it's their turn soon. And um, the security model also includes some network delays, and you, you can basically model that if the adversary has the, has the power to delay certain messages, then it makes it easier for them to attack the system, but as long as you have a bound on that capability, you still have some security guarantees. Whereas um, older protocols just assume that all the messages get exchanged within a block. So um, it also uses key evolving signatures, which is a thing where your key uh, changes over time. So if you steal a key at some point, you cannot use that key that you stole to, to forge signatures in the past because it's it has changed over time. So it's a nice feature that gives you additional security. It's a 37-page research paper, but it fits the same interface as, as this other one. And um, just have a brief look at it. So now all those associated um, types, they, they have some, some meaning. So um, the node needs to keep some state, which is the current state of its evolving key. Um, the, we need some data from the ledger, namely the snake distribution. And when we are the leader because of this private lottery, we need to present some proof that we that we um, have won the lottery, and this is done by some cryptography magic. Um, yeah, we can we can do this by some um, verifiable um, random functions. And yeah, we have an error class. The payload again, we need to have this this um, protocol specific to the payload, and we also need to keep track of some some state for the chain. And now, if you look at the function that. Um, that decides whether we can apply a new block to the chain. It's it's uh, significantly longer than in the simple one because we don't just have to check whether a fixed uh, whether it's a fixed leader schedule, but we have to uh, check the, the stake distribution and we have to verify that proof that this um, the other node has won the lottery. And but it's it's um, yeah it's it's uh, it's fairly nice. So it, it doesn't have any details from from block pres representations or from the ledger. It just uses this um, very small interface to, to those things, to the blocks and to the ledger. 
Uh, now, one, one thing that I wanted to talk about uh, is about testing again. And um, so when, when we have written those, those systems with these, with these um, protocols and everything, we want to test them extensively. And one thing that we use is QuickCheck, where you generate random test data and then check um, against some, some, uh, some model of your, of your system. And the writing generators is something that, that, is, that, that requires skill. And one critical thing in, the, in these protocols uh, is the leader schedule. So the, the, that determines when, in which slot, which leader or multiple leaders or non, no leaders are eligible to, to create a block. And right now we only have a very indirect handle on that via the stake distribution. And that's not good because if you only can influence this indirectly, then you will not be able to write a generator that touches all the, the important edge cases. And so it would really be great if we could just modify a protocol and say, just change this little bit of it and, and change the leader schedule. But apart from that, everything else should be the same. So the question of which chain is prefer preferable to another one, that should not change. But we want to give it an explicit leader schedule that we then can generate in order to hit the, uh, the important edge cases. And we can do that. How do we do that? We uh, write something that uh, we call proto combinator. And um, that is basically something that takes <coughs> a, a given protocol and creates another protocol. So we have this, um, this empty data take with leader schedule. And then we, we have some protocol Ouroboros tag. And then Ouroboros tag with leader schedule P is, is another protocol. And how does it look like? Well, we add some configuration to the node. And the configuration that we add is um, basically the, the leader schedule, which is just a map from slots to, to slot leaders. We have to add some, some special ID to this node, to, to every node. And um, we need to have um, right, and we need to have the configuration of the original node in the original protocol. And then we can override some, some methods. So we want to override the, the function that checks whether we have the right to produce a block. And we want to change it in such a way that it just um, checks the leader schedule and looks whether it is our turn for that given slot. And um, yeah, if, if that is the case, then we are the leader. And if not, then we're not the leader. We also want to uh, change the apply chain state function, which checked whether a given block is a valid extension of the chain. Because um, that should now just um, return unit, because we want is to accept this new schedule. If we didn't change that, then um, we would think that we are the schedule, but other nodes wouldn't agree with us, and that would be bad. And then for all the other, for all the other um, functions, we just use the functions from the, from the original protocol. And that way, we can, we can modify them uh, in, in a directed way. And one application for that is testing, when we want to test um, with specific or with, with properly randomly generated um, leader schedules. Another thing is maybe if we want to um, change um, the way in which we uh, in which we say that that one chain is preferable to the other. So there are there are some uh, subtleties. If you just take the longest chain, then there are some possible attacks, and then you can say if you if you modify that rule, then you can mitigate those attacks. These things uh, become uh, quite quite simple with this construction, where you just say you have the protocol and you modify it a bit, and then you get a new protocol. And um, yeah, so that's that's. Um, basically it. I told you um, about the Cardano system and how we use abstractions and abstract implementations um, in order to keep those, those different components well separated. And the advantages of that is that you have to focus on the essential because you don't have the details of the other components there. You can develop different things in parallel. You can swap in components either for testing or when there's advancements or, uh, or vulnerabilities um, detected. And yeah, for, for testing and mocking, this is very, uh, very convenient. You can do this not only with a crypto layer, you can also do it with, with, the, with the ledger layer and, and everything. So um, yeah, thanks. Um, we've got some time for questions. Yeah. Uh, if, if I understood everything, uh, are you like, because you're focusing a lot on abstraction, uh, you're trying to make the blockchain system, which is uh, like the immutable part to m 
like you can change it now upgrade it right so uh, I've, i've been you know following blockchain a little bit and i know a little bit about substrate and parity so what what you doing different from them like uh, because they are also building something similar right like where you have um, uh, the rust code blob which can which you can send like they have a pseudo packet where you can upgrade the complete blocks in everything from the consensus algorithm to everything they can just upgrade on the runtime okay good <laughs> yeah we, we we can do that as well i mean with that we can basically we can we can change the code because and we do that by by swapping in another instance of the, of this type class mm-hmm. and then what we do when we want to do an upgrade of the consensus protocol on the chain mm-hmm. that's of course something that's a bit subtle right because you have this chain mm-hmm. and then you want to switch the consensus mechanism at some point but everybody has to agree on that right mm-hmm. so what we do in that case is that we first of all we do a code update mm-hmm. and we uh, we basically uh, we have a mechanism for signaling the nodes that they should update and that they should get a new version of the software mm-hmm. but we don't activate the new protocol and how do you so, how do you send the signal like how on, how on the chain so there is there's a special basically a special kind of uh, data that you include in the chain mm-hmm. and that has to be right now it has to be signed by by us mm-hmm. later on there there are um, so so we're also um, developing a kind of framework where stakeholders can vote on update proposals mm-hmm. so that when uh, when the the whole system is decentralized in a way that the development is no longer with one company but with and, and the the blocks would contain the uh, the blocks would contain the code of the blockchain itself right not the whole code not not the, no, the, not the code but yeah, first, yeah. some they, they part of the code that you want to upgrade they, it they would, they would yeah they would, they would tell this this code is this is where you should get the code this is uh, how you check that it's the right code and, and, stuff like that. and then and then you update the code and then the code is updated but the new protocol is not yet activated and then you make another update on the chain that basically tells us okay in in 5 days you should switch the protocol and then everybody does so that I mean, you need to manually uh, upgrade it or it automatically does it for you so it is done by uh, sending information to the blockchain mm-hmm. and then every node that follows the blockchain does this like the the like the like the node will automatically upgrade right yeah. like you don't you don't need to do anything to upgrade that node you don't need to yeah. okay I saw you had like in, in your protocol API some uh, in some cases uh, monads which mm-hmm. are needed. Uh, see why is this is uh, really necessary. I, I think this really complicates. In which one? Would you mention? Oh, you mean here the the randomness or for for the? Um, so you have some calls. You need you need some randomness to create the 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 keys. later on okay um on the protocol the protocol yes uh, somewhere in the for example for the payload constructor ah yeah yeah there we we need to basically um be in an environment where you have access to to an old state mm-hmm. so um and and we need to have some uh, randomness as well i was just wondering if this is necessary to incorporate monads here Does it mean that uh, the code or the protocol has to uh, be correct for any kind of monad then? Uh, when you want to uh, yeah. uh, prove some something or test uh, mm-hmm. your your protocol against or uh, want to prove some properties about it. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand the the question correctly. I mean, if if you write a concrete, maybe let's look at the implementation. Uh, no, that that doesn't really help. So so your your worry is that if we if we have a monad constraint here, that this will will do what? Um, I just uh, can think of uh, testing an, uh, <coughs> a one protocol uh, mm-hmm. in an abstract sense or. Just using the API, mm-hmm. like for example with quick check or so, uh, wouldn't that mean if you have a monad here that you need uh, like uh, uh, this gets more complicated because you you have like uh, monadic code here? Ah, okay. Yeah, some sometimes you. Yeah. I mean, 
mean, it's 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 not it's not a problem for for testing. So, I mean, we we need to have some. I mean, we need to have some source of randomness, and um, we also need to have some some uh, way of getting the getting the state of the node. So, um, instead of having a type class for mono random, you could also input a specific. Uh, a generator, yeah. yeah. And then, you have but, then, but then you would have to keep track of that as well at some at some point. Maybe the concern is you, you could implement a really bad mode of random that has uh, that, that has flawed randomness and then attack it like that. Sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, you should you should use the same uh, randomness source in, in testing that you do in, in production. Yeah, but are you worried that you that you might? That I would I would uh, think maybe you could test uh, your protocol without uh, some constraints or assumptions about uh, your monad or, or your your randomness algorithms. Sorry, you mean I could test it without without using? I I, I think I, I just I just don't. Uh, I think I'm. It's slow right now. So, so you say we could, we should use a more concrete uh, randomness monad here, or to make sure that it's the same testing and production, or what's what's the? I guess yeah, I maybe I, we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I, I guess I'm just a bit slow right now. Same question. And, and just just one correction. So uh, the the node when, when you when you're running maybe a wallet connected to the network regarding the automatically updating question. Mm -hmm. So it, it will tell you that there is an update there, and then it asks you to confirm that you want to install it. So of course you need to tell your computer that it's of course OK to install the new software, but um, it will basically tell you to do this now. And then yeah. Just one more. Mm -hmm. How are the compile times? Hmm? How are the compile times? It looks like a lot of type level uh, <laughs> magic. It's not really type level magic. It's just uh, type classes, associated data types. It's, it's not. It's not not too bad. <laughs> okay. There's worse things you can do.